minutes, ladies, two minutes. Okay, let's make it back to our seats. You can pick a different seat if you want to, now that you've made new friends. Okay, I'm going to put you on the spot. Who made a new friend? Okay, okay, good job. Good job. Okay, we're going to do some door prizes, so if you're ready to win, we're going to get started. All right, if you're in the room and we call your name, you're a winner. If you're not in the room, you don't get to win. This time we're getting rid of everything on the table. So we're getting a stack and here we go. something in your hand and when I call you'll just if we can have the assistant pastors wives come on up and you can help us distribute these guys here we go grab something first prize winner is Emma Andrus Emma are you here right back here right back here next Judy Goodwill where's Judy is she here Judy no Judy Okay, next one, Becky Crosby. Is Becky here? Right here. Awesome. Okay, next, Kim Murphy. Is Kim here? Right there. Next, Linda Kidwell. Is Linda here? Right back here. Next, Yelena Miskovkin. Is Yelena here? No, Yelena. Okay. Next, Teresa Robinson. Teresa, right over here. Beth Moline. Beth, right here. Diane Everett. Is Diane here? Okay, no. Uh, Katrina Kuntz. Is Katrina here? No. Janelle Lopez. Right there, you're a winner. Joyce J. 
Johnson. Joyce, right over here. Um, let's see. Candy Mendenhall, right back here. Pam Young. Pam, right here. Catherine Young. How do you like that? Morgan Dombrowski. Is Morgan here? No. Okay. Uh, Elizabeth McGill. Elizabeth, are you here? No, Elizabeth. Um, Kara Mendenhall. Right back there. Kim Foley. Kim, right back here in the back. Kim Foley. Still going. Sandy Burns. Is Sandy here? Sandy? Nope. Wendy Tuddy. Wendy, right over here. Right here. Raise your hand, Wendy. Uh, Diane Lamb. Is Diane here? No? Okay, let me go get some more. Yeah, I'm Diane. No, I'm not really. Okay, here we go. McKenna Yoder. Is McKenna here? Nope. Linda K. Call. Linda K., are you here? Right back here. Sandra Dutra. Sandra, right back here. Jean Forkner. Is Jean here? Jean Forkner, right here. Jenna Munsterman. No, Jenna? Okay. Um, Ashley Dixon. Ashley? No? Rita Franklin. Is Rita here? Norma Weedrick. Norma! Woo! Rosa McCandless. Woo! Right here. Aaron Gosnell. Aaron, right there. Crystal Gatlin. Crystal, right here. Rosella Hansen. Rosella, right back there. Holly Skinner, right there. Okay, uh, Rebecca Edwards. Rebecca, right there. Bonnie Boatman. Is Bonnie here? Right over here. Sheila Walker, right back there. Iona Hansen, Iona, right there. Cora Maddox, is Cora here? No, Cora, okay. Still got more, are we four? No, five? Five left. Judy Duncan, is Judy here? Right there. Angela Thomas. Why? But Angela's not in here. Sorry, you got to be in here. Joyce Fry. Joyce, right here. What do we got? Three more? Oops. Kim Berkland. She here? Nope. Phyllis Heimbigner. Nope. Namine Thomas. Right there, you're a winner. How about Jill from Liberty? Is it Jill? Right there. Missy Hinton. Missy, are you in here? 
Right here. Is that it? Okay. Good job. Okay, let's sing a little bit. Um, let me get my paper. Hold on. Go ahead and start at the beginning. We're working our way down. Let's sing. Let's talk about Jesus. Here we go. Let's talk about Jesus. Vicki, we were going to introduce any pastor's wives that were here. We forgot. I don't know. Or do we have any pastor's wives that were not here yesterday when we introduced one? Just one? Come on down. Come on. <laughs> oh, you want to introduce yourself? Let me tell you. No. Sarah White from Skyview in Vancouver. Thank you. <laughs> how, the, number two, how precious also are thy thoughts unto me, oh God. Here we go. Ready? How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, oh God. Let's stand. We'll get tired of sitting. If I should count them, they are more in.
to hear from uh, Miss Amber again. You know, I apologized to her yesterday. I didn't even introduce her. I mean, that's the best part. You know, whenever I go speak somewhere and they say all these nice things about me, I'm like, wow, they're talking about me. But they read exactly what I wrote. <laughs> and so I told her, I said, I'm actually going to introduce you this time. Is there anything you want me to say? You know, for $5, I'll say anything you want me to. But um, last year, they were here, I think, in November to come visit, and so I asked her then when she was here if she would come back and speak. One, I, I really loved to hear her speak. I had heard her speak at Hammond, and I, I really enjoyed it, but because she has two daughters here. I'm like, what a bonus. I mean, come on. If I was you know, 2,500 miles away, like I always was with my mom, I would love it if somebody said, hey, you want to come speak where my, where my daughters are? That Yes, that's amazing. And so she, you know, it's like a double, double whammy there. She gets to speak. But we're so happy to have her, and uh, we get to see her. We'll get to see her more because we have a little investment here. So anyway, she talks about how the Northwest is beautiful. She just comes to see her kids. I mean, just, I had one lady come from back east, and she, I was trying to take her to Multnomah Falls, and it was when, you know, they were working on the road, and you, you had this, you couldn't get this way, and you couldn't get that way, and so she goes, hey, wait, wait, there's a waterfall. I said, that's just some rocks falling, I mean, water falling over rocks, come on, and she goes, you're a nature snob, and I said, no, I'm not, I'm trying to get you to the big one, anyway, so 
here we have Miss Amber Bush, Mrs. Amber Bushy, and she's going to come speak for us at this time. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> so we have this little um, thing my husband and I say. We tell our married kids, we have three married children. We still call them kids, don't we? Um, we have three married children and no grandbabies yet. And um, so I said, well, how about we just tell them we'll retire wherever who has the most grandbabies. <laughs> that makes sense to me. And hey, if we can have grandbabies and be in the beautiful Northwest, why not? So, okay. So Derek, if you're listening to this, no. <laughs> No pressure, no pressure. Oh my goodness, um, what a wonderful time this has been. You know, I got to meet Faylene out in the uh, foyer, and I don't know where you are, Faylene, but um, Faylene, Faylene, am I saying it right? Faylene? Okay, get it right, Amber. You just met her a few minutes ago. Um, and I, I said to her, you know, as we were standing back there, I said, if you just close your eyes and you listen to the buzz of the conversation going out in the hallway and you hear the laughter over here and, you, you know, it's so sweet, isn't it? And I think that it's easy for us to take that for granted as Christian ladies. And I remember when we went to the mission field back in 1996, we had been there for six years, and I hadn't been to a ladies' meeting or a ladies' fellowship, and <clears throat> we hadn't started any kind of ladies' meetings. We had started a prayer meeting once a month, but I was raising babies and busy on the mission field, and, um, and I had not had fellowship with a group of ladies like that in a while, and my husband took me to a, a, late, uh, to a conference in uh, Australia, and we flew over there, and I, I don't remember, I think it was our, with our fifth, uh, we had our fifth baby that we took with us, and uh, Nathan, and I was, uh, and it was great, it was an awesome conference, but I had to nurse Nathan, and so I went into the nursery, and there was about eight other ladies in the nursery, and four or five of us were nursing. And I, that was my favorite part of the whole conference. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. I sat in that rocking chair nursing Nathan way too long, I'm sure. And I just like soaked up being with other ladies, literally like, <sighs> it was just so encouraging and so refreshing. And it was so needed. And I think that sometimes we take that for granted, and especially the people that we see all the time, the people that we minister with, and the people that we go to church with all the time. It's easy, isn't it, for us to just, oh, yeah, yeah, that's, those are my church ladies. We need each other, and we need each other's fellowship. And, you know, people who don't have church, that's why they join clubs and they do really strange things. And what was it you were saying this week yesterday about a camping club or something like that? You know, they join these weird clubs. Why? Because they want to belong to something. And that's what we have. This is God's idea. Church is God's idea. And he said, I want you to belong to something. Church is like the best club there is out there. And we get to fellowship with one another. And we have the unity. You know how when you meet somebody, you've, oh my, so I remember um, when you're up here, Miss Kathy, you know, stories just fly in and out of your mind. And you know, I've only got 30 minutes. I can't tell them all. But I remember we were on the ferry going from the North Island to the South Island one time. And almost everybody on the ferry, they were Kiwis. That's what, that's what New Zealanders call themselves. And <clears throat> I walked past a guy, and I heard an accent. I heard an American accent, and I thought, he's not a Kiwi. And so it, I didn't want to be kind of weird, but he was on this payphone, and, um, and I walked by. And so I just kind of like walked around acting like I was doing something in that part of the ferry. 
And then I walked back by when I heard click, and I said, hey, where are you from? And he goes, I'm from Texas. And I was like, cool, I'm American too. And it's sort of like, here we are on the other side of the world, but because, you know, he's from Texas, we're like, yeah, we're friends now because we're both from America, you know. But, um, but it, we need each other, and it's so important for us to g- cultivate good friendships with each other. And, you know, I was thinking, as Kathy was saying, I don't have a whole lot of friends that that I, you know, a a big group of friends. Sometimes, and especially in large churches, we can feel even more alone. So you be that person that reaches out to someone else. Have you thought about the fact that your pastor's wife, as friendly and as outgoing and amazing as she is, do you know she can feel alone sometimes, too? Maybe you hadn't thought about that. But if you're sitting there and you're feeling lonely, and, and this isn't even in my notes, so i got to hurry. Um, I'm going to ignore this. Wait, I set my, I think I set my timer. There it goes. I'm going to ignore this five minutes. Um, but, but just reach out to people. Love people. You be the one to go and help meet someone else's needs. And you'll be surprised because it will take that loneliness away because you're serving and you're ministering, and that's what God asks us to do. He asks us to love one another. If you ever study the one another's in the Bible, it's amazing how many there are. Exhort one another, uh, bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. That's a commandment. Uh, By the way, Miss Patty, where are you? Thank you for my necklace. She's like, I'm sure you didn't want me to say anything, but she gave me this beautiful necklace, and so, and it matches, right? Does it match? I didn't have a mirror, so I'm not really sure. I'm going like this. But anyway, thank you for my necklace. Thank you for encouraging me with a gift and a, and a note, um, a handwritten note. Man, isn't that special? Miss Vicki had a handwritten note in our basket when I got here, and I'm sure she did have one in yours, Kathy. And that's just, that is so special. And I know. <laughs> nah, 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 nah. <laughs> her but I got a note (laughs) oh my goodness and thank you Kathy for the laughter you know laughter is powerful it's medicine yeah give her a hand thank you for the laughter I wish I could put you in my pocket and take you with me you know (laughs) because the joy of the Lord is my strength and that's something that we can choose we can choose to be joyful we don't have to choose to be sour I I love that you know what she said to her daughter who was not really thrilled with with the activity she was like it's okay You, you know we don't have to be thrilled with everything that we do in life it's okay I'm here with you that touched my heart because I love being with my kids And I love the fact that she was, you know, she said to her daughter, we're not necessarily, you're not loving what we're going through right now, but it's okay because I'm here with you. You know how much it means when you're going through something and that friend texts you or calls you? Oh, my goodness, it's so, so wonderfully encouraging. And the songs, and I don't mean to sound repetitive, but thank you for the songs, Kristen. That I recorded the whole first session of the song time because I love to sing. And ladies, if, if music hasn't ministered to you yet in your dark times, would you please let it? Because singing is all through the Bible, especially in the book of Psalms. And I have these times where <clears throat> the accuser of the brethren talks to me and Our life is pretty busy, but there's quiet times, like when I'm putting on my makeup or when I'm doing my hair or something like that. Those, there are certain times where I know that Satan's going to just start whispering things and lies from the enemy. And he is the accuser of the brethren. He never has anything good to say to you. And sometimes we believe those lies. And so I have figured out a long time ago that when I start hearing that, I sing. Because I can try to just change what I'm going to think about, but then I kind of just gravitate towards, back towards it. 
Or if I put the Bible on and I start listening to the Bible, I can listen to the Bible all day long and think about a million other things at the same time. But I can't sing and listen to that. And I think God put that in the Bible for a reason. <laughs> I know he did. And so singing ministers to us. And I wanted to record that because there were several songs that I didn't know the tune to. And I love creating me a clean heart. And I pray that, I try to pray that every single day. Because I know that my heart is desperately wicked. And I want my heart to be clean. And I want the Lord to use me. And so I love that tune. And I want to teach that to my girls. And we do a drive to church about 30, 35 minutes every time too. So we try to use that time to, to read together, to pray together, to sing together. And so we're going to, I'm going to hook that up to my AMP. No, it's okay. <laughs> and we're going to sing along with you, Kristen. So I am going to take you in my pocket. Um, <clears throat> I want to pray real quick. Father, we love you, and we thank you so much for this time to get together, to have fellowship with one another. Lord, fellowship is from you. You sat and you ate with the disciples, and you talked with them. And you sat and you ate with publicans and sinners, and you ministered to them, and you answered their questions. And just thank you. Thank you for fellowship. Thank you that we're not alone. Thank you that... Even if there isn't any other person with us, we always have you. We always have your fellowship. We always have your Holy Spirit. Thank you so much for the Holy Spirit. And we love you. And I ask that you'd use this time to speak to our hearts and be an encouragement and a blessing from your precious word. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, <clears throat> so we've been talking about camping. <clears throat> And I talked yesterday, I mentioned yesterday that one of my favorite parts about camping is eating. <laughs> That's kind of one of my favorite things anyway, no matter if I'm camping or not. But I remember as a young girl, we, it seemed like we always brought the same things camping. We always had baked beans, right? We always, for whatever reason, we always had canned corn, cause, probably because I love corn, and we always had eggs, fried eggs, and they're always black when you eat them because that's how they come out when you cook them on the, over the open fire. And we always had hamburgers because you've got to have hamburgers when you're camping, right? Like it's not even camping if you're not cooking hamburgers over the fire. And then we always had pancakes. And my mom would make up this huge batch of batter, and she would put it in a milk jug, and um, we would take that with us, and we would have pancakes every morning. And, of course, by the end of the, the week or the few days, however long we were there, that pancake mix isn't freshly, you know, made. And so you pour that in a pan, and it goes flat as a pancake, right? <laughs> Comes out really thin. But we always had pancakes and syrup. And that was, I, I loved just the, the camp food, the eating around the fire, the, the hot dogs over the open fire. And when I don't remember having a s'more until I was older, we just didn't know about them, right? I mean, how random is it? I get a cracker and a marshmallow and <laughs> throw on some chocolate. But it's delicious, isn't it? And, okay, so yesterday, whoever said the Reese's Cup on the video, I've never tried that, but I'm going to because... I love Reese's Cups, not just on their own. I like Reese's in ice cream. So I can just about imagine a Reese's Cup on a s'more. Have y'all had that before? Okay, so it must be a Western thing, I guess. But I'm going to go home and I'm going to try this, and I'm excited. And um, if anybody has a tissue, could I, could I please? I have one in my purse, but, um, you know, if you could grab me one, that would be awesome. Um, uh, thank you, Alicia. So, um, so I'm excited to try that. But uh, the, my, so I, well, the talk, my, the lesson, the title of my lesson, talk, sermon, whatever, um, is I want some more of that. In New Zealand, they, I, we didn't do s'mores. Did we ever do s'mores? And yeah, I don't remember at what how old I was when I learned about s'mores. But they don't. Uh, I'd never heard of s'mores even then. But they have this phrase that they'll say when something's really good. They'll say, "Ooh, that is Moorish." Moorish means you want more. Isn't that isn't that cute? Mm, that is really Moorish. And so whether you know this is a Moorish talk or I want some more of that. Either way, both works. 
And I wish that life <clears throat> was as easy as choosing some more of this, or I'll have a little bit of that, or yeah, I'll have some more of that, but no thank you for that. You know, kind of like uh, someone was saying yesterday how we check off the menu, you know, we go to a restaurant and you get the little hangy thing that says, what do you want in your breakfast? You know, I'll have that and that and that. Life is not like that. We don't get to pick and choose what we want more of and what we don't want. I was in Aldi's and I was trying to find some good tomatoes and there was this whole bin of not good tomatoes. And I had to laugh because I'd been standing there for a few minutes trying to find these nice tomatoes and my daughter, Alyssa, was standing next to me and she picked up these big, beautiful, red, gorgeous, perfectly round tomatoes and she goes, Mom, why not these? And I'm like, oh no, those are too expensive. I'm going to go back to this bin of disgusted, old, disgusting old tomatoes because I can save some money. And so I'm literally picking through and this guy comes up next to me and he starts picking through and I'm watching him pick up the same exact tomatoes that I just picked up and went, nope, you know, and wouldn't, wouldn't, you know, if life was as easy as picking out vegetables, nope, don't want that one, nope, oh, yep, this is a good one, I'll take this one, you know. Um, and then along the way, a lot of times we get those big, beautiful, round, juicy red ones that are perfect. If it was only that easy, but it's not, is it? If, you know, I love flowers. I love tulips and lilacs, the smell of lilacs. I love hydrangeas. They don't smell at all, but they're just so beautiful and full, and I love the different colors. <clears throat> but I'd rather not have to, like, go out and make the flowers grow. You know, like, get down in the dirt and hurt my knees and sweat in the sun because I'm a sweater and you know I'd rather not have to do all that but I would really like to have the flowers wouldn't you wouldn't be nice if we could just you know have the flowers with all the work I love babies I love I love every stage of babies I don't know if I have a favorite stage because whatever stage they're in is my favorite and but I'd rather not have to carry them around for nine months you know, I saw this little cartoon. This mama had just had a baby in the, in the hospital. And then as soon as the baby comes out, she dumps it onto the husband and she goes, I carried her the last nine months. <laughs> it's your turn. Um, and potty training and chicken pox. Oh, they're right on the same level for me. Potty training and chicken pox. I have no idea why, but it was always all seven times. It was just this huge. Do I have any young mothers in here right now who are potty training? I don't know what it is, but it's just tough, isn't it? I'd, I'd love to have the baby if you just not have to carry them for nine months and go through labor and then potty training and chicken pox. I'll just take all the other stages. I love piano. Oh my goodness, Carissa, she does an amazing job on the piano, especially transitioning from each song to song to song and different tempos and different keys. She's amazing. Well, I took piano for about two and a half years. And then I was, went to my parents like, I can't stand my teacher. <gasps> he really was a mean teacher. And I, yeah, he's in heaven. So I, if, he, if he happens to be watching what's going on here today in Oregon, but <laughs> no, but seriously, I love piano and, and I love music, but you know, all the hours and hours and hours of practice, I'd rather just pick the piano tomato and just leave the practice tomato alone. <laughs> I love having a husband that loves and adores me, and he does, and I'm so, so blessed, but I really don't like it when we argue, and we do sometimes. I really don't like it when we have a disagreement. And, you know, if I could just have just the sweet, just always sweet, but uh, do we have to go through this too? Yeah. I'd really like to have answers to prayer like Praying Hyde did and many other great Christians. But the sacrifice of leaving other things and not doing other things so that I have, so I get down on my knees and take that time to pray. I really like to ask God, Lord, teach me to pray. I really don't like the sucker punch that he sends that teaches me to pray. 
I really want to say, Lord, complete in you. I'm complete in you. You are everything that I need. You know, only Jesus can satisfy my soul. Ugh. But the way that we have to learn that is through abandonment and through being alone. And that's not fun, is it? The Lord called our family to the mission field. Uh, we, we left, went in 1996. And I was young, and we had two children, and I was pregnant with Rebecca, very pregnant with Rebecca. That was back in the days where you didn't have to have a doctor's notice to get on an airplane when you're nine and a half months pregnant. I was so pregnant. I look back at our picture, and I go, oh, my goodness. And we had all these suitcases and everything and two little kids. And... Um, and the Lord called us to the mission field, and it was wonderful, and I was so excited. But my first holiday on the field without family and really not having anybody yet, it was hard. The hardest part of being on the field was when you would call home, because of course you want to talk to your family on the holidays, and you would hear everybody in the background, and you would hear all that going on, and you just, all oh, the ache and the, and that you would feel in your heart. And I remember the first time my parents came to visit us on the field, and oh, it's just wonderful. They stayed for like a whole month, and we put up a camper in the backyard, and they stayed in that camper, and they were just right there, and it was wonderful. But when they left and we had to say goodbye, I, I don't think I'd ever experienced pain like that up to that point in my life. And honestly, the pain hurt so bad, I thought, was it worth it that they came? That might sound terrible, but that is how. Because, you know, New Zealand is about as far as the uttermost part of the earth as you can get. And so, and that was the first time they had come to visit. Now, after you've been there a few years and they've come a couple times and you've flown back to the States for a wedding or for something special, after you've done it a few times, it does get a whole lot easier. And you realize, well, it's only 16 hours on a flight and then you have a little uh, uh, layover for about three hours and then you have another eight-hour flight and then depending on where you go on, you have another layover and then maybe another two or three hours. It's not that big of a deal. It really is you can see them again it's not forever um, but it was it was hard and it was lonely and I used to you know say the verse to the Lord often to those who have forsaken uh, mother and father and brother and sister and, and, and home and you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna reward me right you're gonna make up for for all of this loneliness and of course the Lord always blesses and the Lord always keeps his promise and has never broken a promise Psalm 34, 8 is usually the verse that I sign, that I put at the bottom of cards or notes. I love it. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. We have to trust, don't we? We have to see, oh, God, you are so good to me. I trust in you. Philippians 4, 11 through 13 not that I speak in respect of want, for I have, do you know what the next word is? Learned. It's something that we have to learn, that in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. In the margin of my Bible, next to that verse, I uh, underlined the word state, and I wrote country. I had to learn that whether I was in America or whether I was in New Zealand or whether I was in Thailand, to be content. You see, I used to sometimes think about our children and maybe the things that they were missing out on in America. I grew up in a church that had so many opportunities in a Christian school, and I was in sports and cheerleading, and I had a great, great Christian school experience and a lot of opportunities with music groups and and got to go off to college and all that. And I would think about the things that I thought that they were missing out on. And I had to, on purpose, say, Lord, this is, this is, and they didn't miss out on anything. We had an amazing life. Sometimes you would think, don't tell people how amazing it is on the mission field. They won't think we're suffering. <laughs> and, and it was uh, in so many incredible blessings. But sacrifices, yeah. 
there were a few sacrifices. In uh, the year of 2011, we had been in uh, Thailand for three years, and uh, they, we had a flood that came through and covered almost the whole country, uh, well, the whole uh, southern, or northern part of where we were, and displaced uh, millions of people and we were in that, and we had uh, everything just happened really quickly, and, and we had about an hour. We got a phone call from a policeman in our church, and he said, you got to get stuff together, and you got to get out. You have about an hour. And so we're all running around, and we're trying to put important stuff up high so that the water won't get to it. And, um, and the kids are saying, you know, I just said, grab, grab some clothes and put it in a plastic bag. We didn't even take time to get suitcases. And, um, and I said, just grab three days worth. And so they're all grabbing clothes. And it was the day after, it was October 19th, 2011, the day after Alyssa, who was our youngest and our only one born in, in Thailand, she had just turned three years old and she had gotten her very first doll. And so she, she was like, where's my doll? And so we found her doll, and we put it in a bag, and we put it right by the front door so we, we wouldn't um, forget it. And we had another family that was on the team that was coming over, and they were getting some stuff together and meeting us there, and another single lady. And then we had a Thai boy that lived with us, and he was there, and he was getting stuff together. It was just like, there's the nine of us, you know? And so the extra families, and, and just the extra, it was a lot going on in that hour. And so we're, we're rushing around, and... We, um, we, we got out, when, when, we, when we got out of um, Mung Ake, the, the, the village, they call them, where we lived, the water was coming up in the bottom of our vehicles, and, and, it, and everything just happened really fast. We were safe. We were fine. You learn, if you've ever been through a natural disaster, you learn what's really important. Stuff is just stuff. We were all safe, and we had each other, and we lost almost everything, which was fine. We have, you know, we came back to furniture floating all through the house, the refrigerator upside down, all the stuff that we thought we put, like, in boxes up on top of the kitchen table so it would be safe, completely underwater and everything. It was a crazy time. But the Lord, we were um, displaced for three months, and so we, we were staying in different places. And I remember one morning, I was just like feeling so sorry for myself. And I was sitting on the couch in this place where we were staying. And Alyssa, well, by the way, so we realized that she, we had forgotten her baby doll. And it, we had put it by the door and we had forgotten it. And so she's so cute, she couldn't say flood. And so when she realized that she had forgotten her baby doll, she was like, I lost it in the blood. And I was like, oh, oh, you know. And here I am, I'm feeling sorry for myself, sitting on the couch, you know, I'm trying to read the Bible, I'm trying to praise the Lord. I'm like, oh, woe is me. And she walks into that room, and she has a um, dish, uh, what, a towel, a dry towel. Okay, she's a dry towel. And, and, and she was cradling me like this, and she was rocking it back and forth. I was like, oh, Lisa, what do you have? And she goes, this is my baby. And I said, oh, you're a baby. And, you know, this, I'm thinking, oh, she lost her first baby doll, and she doesn't have it anymore. And I open the towel, and inside of it is a hairbrush. Hmm. And um, and my three-year-old taught me such a great lesson on contentment. You know, I was feeling sorry for myself. We'll never get back into that house. We've lost everything in that house. Um, the church was underwater. Every team family was here, there, and everywhere. We didn't even know where all of our church people were because they didn't have the money to go to a hotel or go three hours south and get out, you know, get to safety. Um, but my little Alyssa Grace carrying a hairbrush wrapped in a towel. That was her baby. And we did get back into the house, and we did find her baby doll in the little bag that we had put it in. It was covered in black muck, so we didn't try to salvage it. But I've never forgotten that lesson. You know, no matter what life gives you, we can learn to be content in the state that we are in. Paul said, I know both 
how to be abased, and I know how to abound everywhere, and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to suffer, both to abound and to suffer need. I had another experience when we were in New Zealand, and this is maybe going to seem like a really ex silly experience, but I wanted a new shirt. There's nothing wrong with wanting a new shirt. Is there anything wrong with wanting a new shirt? Any of you buy a new shirt in the last month? Or new dress? And, but uh, shops in New Zealand were, um, it was really hard to find nice clothes and they were really expensive and it was always really challenging to get nice things and I didn't, I was, I was one of seven growing up and, and you know, we didn't have a lot of money and always got hand-me-downs and that was fine. It was, I'm not a shopper, still not a shopper. And so it, but, but for whatever reason, I really, really, really wanted a new shirt. And so I was praying, and we had this shop, and I found a shirt, and I was so excited. It was so pretty, and I was so happy to have this shirt. Again, nothing wrong with having a new shirt. But I didn't realize how important that had become to me until the day, and I had only worn it. I think this was like the second time I had worn it, and I had lit a candle on the kitchen table, and I was reaching over to give something to one of the kids, and my pretty little sheer sleeve brushed over the candle and caught on fire, and I'm like, <clears throat> and I'm trying to get it, and I mean like that quick, a big, huge hole in my sleeve, and I went back to the bedroom and bawled like a baby. God, I prayed for this shirt for so long, I can't, and you finally gave me a shirt, and now it's ruined, and I have to throw it. I was, I was devastated over a stupid shirt. And the Lord showed me that, I mean, there's nothing wrong with having a new shirt, but he showed me that I was covetous, that it had become so important that I have this shirt, and that when I didn't have it anymore, I just thought, What's wrong with me? What's wrong with you, God? Why don't you why won't you let me have this shirt? I would say that and I read this definition of covetous is it's an inordinate desire to have more than what God has given me. Because my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. It's okay to want to have a nicer car. It's okay to want to have a house that's big enough for your whole family. It's okay to want nice things, but it becomes covetousness when it's a desire to have more than what God has given me. And contentment, which is the opposite of that, is just being satisfied. I have enough. God is going to supply all my needs. Hebrews 13 says, let your conversation, your conduct, or your manner be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. Remember, it's something that we have to learn. Since the beginning of time, since the very first woman that ever lived, what did Satan convince Eve of? There's something you're missing out on. There's something you don't have. And I don't know why we're this way, but we women, we tend to be that way. At least the women that I've gotten to know, we tend to feel like we're missing out on something, don't we? We tend to feel like, oh, there's something that we haven't quite gotten yet. God's, you know, God hasn't given me this yet, and we have to learn contentment. Now, I have a few girls, and I have to hurry and finish up, but I have a few teenage girls, and they've got some jolly ranchers, and they're going to get up right now, and they're going to pass out these Jolly Ranchers, and they're just going to go and kind of give them out really, really quickly. Now, you might like Jolly Ranchers, and you might not. Personally, I used to love them, but now they get stuck in my teeth. And, you know, you, you try, they get stuck on one side, and you dislodge it, and it goes the other side, and gets stuck on the other side, right? So you don't have to eat this, but if you want to, you can open it up. It's always noisy. It's really hard to eat a Jolly Rancher in church because it's so noisy to open. But I... If, if you want to stick that in your mouth and think about this, because I have some things that, you know, and, and, and the reason I picked Jolly Ranchers is because they last a long time in your mouth, and you can suck on, and they make your mouth water, right? And you can suck on them for a long, long time. So while you're sucking on those, I have some questions that I want you 
to think about. And I thought maybe they'd be a little bit easier to think about them if you had something sweet in your mouth. So contentment is realizing that God has already provided everything that I need to glorify and enjoy him. I heard it one way said that he's already given me everything that I need to be happy, and I thought, that's not really a good definition to be happy because, you know, God doesn't say I'm going to be happy all the time. But he's given me everything that I need to, to glorify him and to enjoy him. You see, Paul said that, that tribulation works patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. Carrie could get up here, and she could teach us a whole lot about patience, the things that she's experienced and gone through, hope that you only find when you've gone down to the bottom of some dark places, grace that you never knew you needed before. And God gives us that kind of grace. I'm going to skip this and this and go to my questions. So, question number one. And I'll hurry, Miss Vicki. What is it that you think you can't be happy without? Do you need more money or you think you need more money? Do you wish you had, your life wasn't so crazy busy and you had more time for pleasurable activities? Do you wish you had a nicer car? My car happens to be in the shop right now. It's died on me like 10 times in the last month. I think it's a goner. I kind of need wheels to get around. Um, do you want a happier marriage or one that's truly Christian? Do you want a better relationship with a certain family member? Do you want better health? What is it that you think you can't be happy until you get it? Deciding, I, there's, I'm, just, I'm just not going to be happy, I'm not going to be satisfied, unless this, has, this happens. A deep longing or a craving, even though God hasn't chosen to give it to you yet. You know, the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. That is a long time. And he provided everything that they needed. But they were in the wilderness for a long time. My second question. Are you making these desires your focus while God is your peripheral? When the opposite should be true, that God should be my focus? And my desires, my peripheral, it's okay to have desires. But if God is my focus, I have everything I need. I'm not waiting for this to happen or this to happen. To have deep satisfaction because of Jesus. Contentment, remember, realizing that God has already provided everything that I need to glorify and enjoy him. And then number three, are you willing to adjust your desires to the purpose and plan that God has chosen? It's not the tomato you would have chosen. But God has chosen it. And we do tend to compare ourselves with each other, don't we? That's why God said, don't do that. It's not wise. Because, man, I'd, I'd like to have, wow, that's, wow, look at her life. And guys, it's always greener on the other side, and their life is not all roses. And that's one of the reasons, just one of the many reasons why social media is just like so, uh, it's just so not genuine because that happy face doesn't show the burdens that they're carrying. We long for a better situation, and we assume that having it will bring contentment, don't we? And yet, think about this, Eve's life, was perfect. There was no sin in the garden, and she got to walk with God every single day, and yet she felt like there was something she was missing out on. Two more questions, and I'm done. Question four, are you willing to submit or to surrender to God's wise and loving disposal for everything in your life? We sing, I surrender all, but don't, we don't really mean it, do we? 
And then lastly, are you willing to thank God even in the middle of your undesirable circumstance? Not thank you, God, that I'm suffering, but God, thank you for the things that you want to teach me through this. Thank you that I get to experience your provision and your grace and your mercy because problems are an amazing way for God to show how good he is. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. 1 Thessalonians 5.18, in everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. I mentioned it yesterday. Gratitude is a game changer. About five years ago, and I don't even know if my girls know this, I came to a dark place. Uh, A place where I had not surrendered the situation to the Lord. And I remember lying on the living room floor one night. Sorry. And I said, I was mad at God. I said, I think I've done everything the way I'm supposed to do it. And I don't understand why, why I'm going through this. And I'm not getting up off this floor until you help me to know how to get out of this dark place. And I laid there for hours on the floor. And I sat up on the floor and I opened my Bible. And the Holy Spirit, just as audible as I'm speaking to you, said, you stopped being thankful. I was like, I say thank you. I say thank you to my husband. I say thank you to you. I think I'm thankful. And the Lord said, no, you're not. You're not thankful for everything. You're not giving thanks in everything. And it was, it was a game changer for me. Now, I, can't, I wish I could say I've stayed there, but I've slipped down. I've had to remind myself, remember that night you laid on the floor? You don't want to get back down there again. Because we get to relearn lessons over and over again. But I'm so thankful that God's merciful and God's patient. And I'm so thankful that even though life isn't as easy as picking out the good tomatoes and leaving the bad tomatoes, I'm so thankful that God always provides everything that I need to go through everything that I must. Thank you. Hello, ladies. I am not a camper. I'm probably one of the few ladies in here who would make that statement. I didn't know much about camping. I know about day trips and, you know, doing camp cookouts, like at state parks. We do that a lot. But camping is not something that we do. As I did some research on camping, I discovered that there are actually 14 different styles of camping. And one that kind of spoke to me Miss Toby mentioned it in the vi- one of the videos yesterday. She said glamping. That kind of speaks to me, you know, where you don't have to sleep on the floor. You can be at one of those places where they have the resort type amenities, where they have all the activities planned and all of that. I think I could really get into that, but traditional camping, probably not. But as I also started digging into the scripture, I realized that God uses camping a lot in the Bible. He uses a lot of different camping type experiences where he just gets his children out in the middle of nowhere and he gets them to a spot where they have to only hear him because that's all that there is and we hear his voice and he gets us to the place where we realize that we are nothing without him and we can't we can't do it on our own and um, brother Colby if you can put that picture up on the screen for me So I am a mom of four young children. Um, My oldest is eight. I have a seven-year-old, a five-year-old, and a three-year-old. 
and three of them are in school. One of them is still at home with me, which I love. Ladies keep asking me, are you going to put them in the preschool? And I said, no, absolutely not. I want them at home with me as long as possible because once they go to school, it eats up so much of their time and you don't get, ever get that back. Um, but the Bible tells us in Ephesians 6, um, 10, it talks about putting on the whole armor of God. And I just want to pick out a few verses. As a mom of young kids, these kind of pop out to me and they speak to me. Um, in verse 13 where it says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins skirt about you with truth. And as a mom of young kids, I feel like kids are constantly pulling on your clothes, telling you, Mom, Mom, I need this, I need that. And if your clothes aren't fitting properly, sometimes they could slide off. It's like, whoop, wait a second, not yet. Having the breastplate of righteousness, um, you can see by the picture, I have three boys. And Brittany is our lone girl, and but she holds holds her own. And there's constantly, we're playing cowboys and Indians, you know, they're having Nerf gun wars, things are coming at you from every direction, so you want to always be on your guard. Um, have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel. I was telling um, someone the other night, I was like, you know, it would be really helpful if they made women's shoes with the steel toes. Because... <laughs> I don't think I have very many shoes in my closet that the toes aren't scuffed up, not because I'm scuffing them up, but because the kids are constantly stepping on my toes. And then someone mentioned they need to have like an extra barrier around the foot so it stops the toys before they actually get to your foot. I was like, that would be perfect. Um, and having, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Um, First thing I would think of if I actually were to go camping or one of our day trips as we like to do is I want to be prepared. And before having kids, I was more the spur of the moment thing type of person like, oh, you want to go do this? Sure, yeah, I don't have anything on my schedule. Let's go do it. Well, four kids later, that's not as easy to do. You have so many things that you have to think about and plan and take with you and so I have become a planner and I want to plan things out what are we going to do where are we going to be what are we going to need I hate getting to that place and realizing we're missing one thing and that just that drives me nuts I love being prepared um, maybe some of you have had some of these moments too where especially with my kids in school We've had a busy weekend. I thought I did all the laundry. Monday morning rolls around, and you jump out of bed, and you're like, I did the laundry, right? Where's their uniforms? So you run in the room. You're looking in the closet, and you, pull, you're, you see one, so you pull it out, and you're like, wait a second. They hung up the dirty one? Really? Okay, so you start digging in the laundry basket because you're like, if they hung up the dirty one, then the clean one's probably in the basket. You're hoping to find one that is clean enough that you can use and then you're rushing around trying to do other things. No matter how hard you plan, we all know life happens. And sometimes you are just not as prepared as you want to be. But we do our best and we try. And so one of the things that I think of, with, especially with our Christian walk, is to be prepared. And I always like having a list of supplies that I can check off. Okay, we've got everything. And I kind of equal that to our prayer list. Um, having something that we can sit down, we can look at, and we can pray for others. And then our map is obviously our Bible, God's Word. And I love that the ladies already mentioned that today, um, is that he's got everything laid out here for us. We just have to open it up and use it and apply it. Um, so second, I would say, obviously, you've got to be equipped. You have to have everything you need. And so this is my bag of things of like an essential hiker would need we've got the toilet paper we've got the sunscreen we've got you know the bug spray and all those different things water bottles snacks because as a mom I can't even just go to the store without snacks because as soon as you walk in the door mom do you have a snack we're here to shop for food no I don't have it with me but you have to have the snacks and and all those different things um so be prepared and be equipped and then I think that, you know what, all of this stuff isn't going to do me any good if I'm not knowledgeable in how to use it. And, um, you know, sometimes we think that we 
need to have the right things in our bag, and you know what? If we don't know how to use them, they're not going to do us any good. But the beautiful thing about our Christian walk is that God knows exactly what equipment we need. He already has it all packed up for us. All we have to do is reach in, pull it out of the bag. He'll even tell us how to use it, and we just have to apply it. Um, So be knowledgeable. Challenge yourself to spend time in God's Word. It's great reading the Bible, but sometimes, I don't know if you're like me, but sometimes I read something and I'm like, wait a second, what what did I just read? So you have to reread it again, but studying, studying the Scripture, meditating on it, applying it. Another one of the uh, good ways is to um, being able to hear it taught by someone more experienced than ourselves. I mean, we, we can say, like, yeah, we're going to go camping or we're going to go hiking, and we have no knowledge about it. And we're like, oh, I read a few things, you know, about it. But you've never experienced it yourself, so you really don't know exactly what you're going to go through. But sometimes hand-on experience is the best. And then learning from someone that's more experienced than yourself. And I think of, you know, our pastors and our other spiritual leaders in our church, our Sunday school teachers, and and those who have experienced things and they can teach us um, from God's word. And then be reasonable. Take only what is necessary. As a first-time mom, you know, you pack the diaper bag and you have this long list of things that you put in there and you're like, I don't know how long we're going to be gone. I don't know what we're going to experience, but we might need it, so let's just shove it in there. Um, And that's kind of my pink backpack here. As I told you, glamping is kind of more my speed. And so I've got, no matter what I do, I want to look good doing it. So I've got, you know, my makeup, my, you know, hairbrush, hairspray, portable curling iron, you know. You never know what you might need. So I like to be overprepared. The moment you take something out of the bag is the moment that you need it. Um, But Paul tells us in Philippians 3, he said, those things that were gained to me, I count them for loss for Christ. And he's telling us that he got to the point where he just had to lay everything aside that didn't have to do with him following and focusing on Christ because it's just going to slow us down and weigh us down and we're not going to be able to function like God would have us do. And lastly, be focused and have a plan. Um, the Bible also tells us in Philippians 3, it says, but thir- verse 13, But this one thing I do, forgetting those things that are behind, reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I want my goal to be that I have such a strong relationship with Christ that I am an example to my children so that everything I do, I can point them towards Christ. Because one day, as I know and I'm discovering, it is going by so fast. In just a few short years, I'm not going to have any kids at home with me anymore. They're going to be all in school, and they're going to be experiencing things on their own. I won't be there to hold their hand all the time. And I want them to know that even though mom isn't there or maybe dad isn't there with me, that there is someone who is with me every step of the way, and I am pointing them to Christ, and they can call out to him any time that they need him. And I want to leave you with this. When we walk with the Lord and we obey him, he will then provide for us every step of the way. So as something that my kids always ask us when we're in the car, are we there yet? Probably not. No, we're not there yet. None of us are perfect, and we obviously won't receive that until one day in heaven. But I want us to focus, challenge ourselves to focus more on being a camper instead of a glamper. Thank you. All right, let's all stand up for a minute so we don't fall asleep. I'm not as funny as Kathy, so I can't keep you awake with stories. <laughs> so let's stand for a minute. I want to um, talk to you just for 10 minutes or less on stay on the path. Let me tell you what the Bible says about this as soon as I get my glasses.
when you turn 40, your eyesight goes down. And I remember my husband was, I, I started using readers before he did. And he's like, do you, I mean, everywhere I go, I'd have to have a pair of glasses. And he, he didn't like to have them. And I remember one day in Sunday school, he was reading the Bible. And I'm in the back like, I'm like, honey, no more reading God's word without your readers. <laughs> I said, you, 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 don't, you can't see it, and you're putting words in God's mouth, so no. <laughs> so here's what the, God says about paths. Proverbs 4.26, ponder the path of thy feet, and let all thy ways be established. Psalm 16.11, thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Psalms 23, verse 3. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Psalms 25, 4. Show me thy ways, O Lord. Teach me thy paths. Psalms 27, 11. Teach me thy way, O Lord. And lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies. Proverbs 3, 6. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Um, I think when I think of stay on the path of, of the Christian life, um, the first thing is determine God's plan for you. A lot of this has been hit in different directions, but God's plan for my best friend is not necessarily God's plan for me. So in the Christian life, as we try, strive to stay on the path, make sure you're staying on the path that God has determined for you. Um, and the way to do that, if you've ever gone um, hiking or on a trail, um, and, or you're being taught about it as little children, um, I can remember we, when I was, for the first seven years of our life, we lived in Tennessee, and we lived on 32 acres of woods, and we would go on the paths all the time, and my dad taught us um, certain things about taking that walk on the path. And he said, the most important thing, if you're ever going to take a walk on a path, is stay on the path, first of all, but determine reference points. Determine reference points on that path. You say, what does that mean? Well, when you, when you start down the path, if there's a stream on your right side, then if you get lost and you're trying to get home, then the stream should be on your left side. If there's a fence post right here on your left, then on your way back it should be on the other side. So you look, look for things that help you determine where you are so you can gain a point of reference so that you won't get lost. Um, the Bible says in Jeremiah 10.23, it says, O oh Lord... I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. So I guess I'm not the reference point for me. We're not like the geese that migrate to warmer areas and times of the year and then migrate back we're not like the homing pigeons that you know they can find their way no it's not in man it is not in man we don't have a built-in gps unless we have our phones with us and then we can find everything right most of the time um but reference points in the christian life are key to staying on the path if that's the case then we better think about what are our reference points as christians um, our reference points as Christians, Psalms 37, 23 says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. In the Christian life, God helps us by giving reference points, and the most important reference point that we will ever have, and you've been pointing to this already, is this word, is God's word. It has, my, my dad, I can't even tell you how many times you have all the answers right here. How many times do we wring our hands and we're stressed out and we don't, oh, I don't know what to do. You're telling everybody that will listen. 
But right here is the answer. The Bible is our reference point. The Bible says, Psalms 37, 31, the law of his God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. That's pretty good. The Bible says, Psalms 119, 133, order my steps in thy word and let not any iniquity have dominion over me. Psalms 119, 105, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. In Little Bear Bible Club, we sing God's word is like a hammer that breaketh the rock in twain, a lamp to guide our footsteps and a light on the stormy main. This is, this is the light. Psalms 119.35, make me to go in the path of thy commandments, for therein do I delight. You can have a seat. The Bible, our reference point. Okay, that's one. How about another reference point in the Christian life? And we've, these are similar points to what you've already heard. Those going before you. Reference points. Um, how about as children, adult children even still today, your parents, if they're good Christians, your pastor, good Christian friends, mentors, people that have invested in you that are farther down the road ahead of you. The Bible says in Jeremiah 3.15, And I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. 1 Corinthians 10, 11. Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the wor world are come. You know what, in life, one thing I've tried to do, and something I've tried to encourage my children to do, is in the Christian life, look around, observe, look for people that are farther down the road of where you want to be. And then follow their example. I think we are surrounded in our world with examples, good ones and bad ones. Let's, what did it take to get that person to that spot? If they're at a spot we don't want to be, then let's backtrack. Let's not do that then. Let's change. Let's fix the reference point there. Um, say no to anything that's off path. The Bible says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. You know what? One, uh, one quote that I love is, the darker the night, the brighter the light. Aren't we thankful for those people that are letting their light shine ahead of us? that are helping us along the way. Proverbs 4, 25 and 27, through 27 says, Let thine eyes look right on, and let thine eyelids look straight before thee. Ponder the path of thy feet, and let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right hand, nor to the left. Remove thy foot from evil. You know what? On the path that God has chosen for us, we are commanded to let our light shine. We are called to be salt and light. We're called to be a peculiar people. Let's decide to do that to the best of our ability. You know, I talked in this point about people that have gone on before us. And we're looking to their choices and their decisions to navigate which way we're going. But guess what? On our walk, on our path of life, as we navigate our way, There's people behind us. You know, the Bible says, um, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. I heard an illustration about this verse that I've thought about so many times recently. I thought, how come I never thought of this before? But, you know, the Bible tells us, love not the world. We are in the world. We should be in the world, but we should not be of the world. And... I heard this illustration that said, you know what, you can have the most beautiful boat. And it, was, it can, beautiful paint, all the 
accessories on it. It can, it can look awesome. You can, wow, look at this boat I've got. Oh, it's so pretty and not a chip on it. And you can go on the open water and it's going to float. And it's, but you know what? If you never take that boat and you put it in water, the boat will never be used for what it was made for. You can look at it all day. Beautiful. Not a scratch. Float anywhere. But the boat never was used for what it was created for. So we take that boat and we put it in the water. Now it is fulfilled because it's doing what it's supposed to do. It's in the water. But if you take the water outside of the boat and dump all the water into the boat, beautiful boat, not a scratch. It'll float everywhere. You keep dumping water in the boat, what's going to happen? It's going to sink, and it's good for nothing. Ladies, we're Christians. We can be the most beautiful Christian you've ever seen. We can have dot all of our I's and the Christian life and all, all of our T's crossed. We can have it all together. We can be great Christians, but we, we're not salt and light if we, we're not in the world, if we're not in the water. But you know what, ladies, the problem today, we are letting so much of the world into our lives that we are sinking and we are good for nothing because we're not the light that we need to be. Let's be very careful in our path that we don't let that happen. Because, as I said before, I'll close with this one last illustration from, from my dad. Um, the last thing I want to tell you about is I'm thankful for those in my life that didn't stray off that path. They stayed on their path. Not only is it important to determine the path that we're on, but determine those behind us. Who's following your path? Who's behind you? You know, some, I've talked to people before that were making wrong choices. And I've said, you, you need to, let's be careful. Let's make right choices. It doesn't matter, they would say. It does matter. Because you'll never make a choice that only affects you. It, you won't. If you're a mother, it'll affect your family and your kids. Or your grandkids. If you're a friend... We don't want to be the type of friend that pulls another one down because we've made a wrong choice. Um, in navigation, uh, my dad uses this illustration, and I love it. Um, he always said to us, and has used it, that someone is navigating their life by yours. They're watching. You're further down that path, and they're navigating by you. Do you know that we need to be really careful that we don't move off the path? Don't stray, because scientific research has shown that if someone is navigating by a particular point, if you travel one degree off course, someone's navigating by you, they'll miss, they'll miss the target by 92 feet. For every 60 miles that you are off course, they would miss the target by a mile. Going off course just one degree it will make a huge impact on where you end up, but it will make a huge impact of, of those that are following you. So let's stay on the path. I can uh, remember as a child holding my dad's hand in precarious situations. Hold my hand. If it was uncertain, crossing the street in a busy crowd of people, hold my hand. And you know what, ladies? We have the Lord holding our hand. Let's keep holding his hand because if, if we do, we're not going to stray off the path. We're going to stay right where he has for us. This has been so good. I'm just going to finish it up really quick. And, uh, you know, I was sitting there. I'm a little OCE about looking at things, but I was looking at this picture and I'm thinking, how perfect. What is holding up the camper? The rock. The rock. Okay, this is so symbolic. Okay, there's the guitar. We've been talking about the singing. You're supposed to sing to the Lord. Um, keep all your cactuses outside. <laughs> you, you've got that friend. You've got that cactus friend. 
And then it's got the fire. He said, did not his word burn within my heart? And then it's got the things that Miss Amber said you're supposed to put on, like the humility and the meekness. That's on the clothesline over there. And then it's got a table with two chairs, with two cups, because we're supposed to fellowship. And then I was thinking, okay, the cloud by day, he's our shade, there's the tree, we prosper if we're planted. But I'm like, this picture, I'm so glad we picked that. I mean, man, it says it all. But I'm going to end with, have you ever told anybody to take a hike? <laughs> you can just take a hike. My, my favorite saying is, you can take a long walk off a short pier. <laughs> but anyway, uh, you know, t take a hike means go away. Just go away. And there's been times where we've wanted to say that, but I'm going to tell you today, don't take a hike. Don't take a hike. Um, you know, we can get, uh, if we stay on the path like we've been talking about the whole time, then we're not getting into poison ivy. Anybody ever had a good dose of poison ivy? <laughs> you know, I mean, I learned as a small child, leave the three, leave them be. I mean, you know, we don't teach our kids those fundamentals of the faith anymore. Um, we can get into darkness. We can get into wild animals. We can get into falling rocks. Have you ever been to a state park or something that says stay on the path? Well, I'm a rebellious person. First thing I'm thinking is what's over there? <laughs> what, what don't you want me to see? Uh, I'm not a hiker like Miss Kathy. It's <laughs> not a hiker. Every time my husband wants to take me somewhere, I said, I think we could Google this. You know, in my living room, feet propped up, drinking sweet tea, eating Cheetos. I, you know, I'm just telling you, with Google Earth, you can see everything. And not sweat and not take a hike. But, um, you know what? You can get into areas where there's, like, quicksand. And anybody ever been to um, Yellowstone? And they're like, you know, don't go over here. You know, and then they tell you the story. Somebody went there chasing their dog and... Oh, whoa, there we go, the dog and the owner, <laughs> bye-bye. Uh, you know, you need to stay on the path. There's slide areas, there's things going on. I worry every time I go a play, by a place driving, it says, watch for falling rocks. And then you hear on the news, you know, Volkswagen Beetle. <laughs> I'm thinking, you know, I, I want to get in the other lane. That scares me. Um, but you know what? The re we don't say stay on the path because we want you to miss fun. We don't stay on the path, path because I used to tell my kids when I taught school, I'm like, your parents do not stay up late at night going, what can I do to make their life miserable tomorrow? <laughs> your parents don't do that. The reason they have rules or the reason they're telling you what to do or what not to do is because they want you to be safe. I remember one time walking across the street with my mom and my grandmother, and my mom was always karate chopping me in the back, telling me to stand up straight, stand up straight, be loud, be proud of your height, Vicky. You know, all my friends were short, and I'm like, eh, I, I, I didn't want to be tall and in charge. But my, my mom was always karate chopping. We're going across the road, and my grandmother grabs my mother's hand. My mother at the time was probably like 55. And she goes, Mom, you don't need to hold my hand. And I said, well, I was just waiting for you to karate chop me in the back. You know, now that I'm married and I'm older, too. Uh, it, it's... We, we say those things because we want you safe. The reason God says those is because he wants you safe. He doesn't want you hurt. You know, when the trail, trail gets too long and we get too tired or we get bored or when it feels like you're never going to get to that spectacular view. Uh, one time a pastor uh, told my husband, we're going to go to Buttermilk Creek Falls today. Well, that turned me off right away because I knew that was going to involve walking. And you know what? When your knees are bone on bone, that is not like, woohoo, I can't wait, I can't wait. I should have known something was wrong when his wife said, I'm going to stay here and work from home. Okay. So it's me, the pastor, my husband, and his 12-year-old son. So we're going along. And, you know, at first it was kind of like a little pavement and the trees were over and I'm trying to enjoy the view and I'm walking along and I'm trying to entertain the 12 year old and the two preachers are talking and then we walked and I'm of the, the mind 
However far you walk out there, you got to walk it back. So when they tell you, oh, it's only three miles. No, six. I'm, I, my mama didn't raise no dummy. I mean, I know these things. So we're walking along, and all of a sudden, you know, and the preachers are just talking, and all of a sudden, the path goes to gravel. The trees disappear. I'm hot. When I get hot, watch out. I'm grumpy. I'm, I'm not happy. We're going along, and then all of a sudden, I, I mean, I'm smart. I'm putting two and two together, and I'm realizing we're on an industrial frontage road that's going over there to that plant. There is no Buttermilk Creek Falls. And so I'm breaking up the pastors, talking, and I'm like, excuse me, boys, we're on a frontage road going to that plan over there and they're like oh are we are we and then they're like they're just laughing their heads off yeah i guess we missed buttermilk creek falls we're we're just talking we should have taken a turn (laughs) i'm not in hiking shoes i'm not even in hiking clothes i'm hot and i've told this little 12 year old about all that I want to tell them (laughs) so I just whip it around and I start walking as my mother would say like I'm on a mission I'm walking and my husband's going uh honey uh what are you thirsty well what's he gonna do about it there is no you got water in your pocket no you don't and I'm just like I'm just all I could think was I'm trying to get back to the pavement I'm trying to get back to the trees and every once in a while they have these little bins he goes would you like to sit Mm -mm." I'm giving him a look like I'm on my way to that truck and then we're about you know two miles back that way and the guy goes would you look at it there's the sign for Buttermilk Creek Falls. Right after the sign was a hill that went straight up. And he goes, did you want to go? <laughs> I told my husband, I said, I'll wait right here. You two just hike it on up there. And, he, and the preacher goes, well, I've already seen it before. I said, well, we'll Google it later. <laughs> we get back. We get back, and he goes, oh, Mrs. Mutcher, I'm really sorry, really sorry about this. I mean, I know you're hot, but I've got this special little place we're going to have lunch. It's called the Jail House Pizza. And I hope there's an empty cell because I'm putting you in it. (laughs) And we get over there, and what does it say? Closed on Mondays. All I want is a drink of water. I mean, I don't even care about any food at this point. We go to this other place, and and the guys are just laughing. Wasn't that the funniest thing ever? No. I'm still grumpy about it, even after I had my water and my pizza. So we get back home, and my husband says, you know what, before we have service tonight, because we were doing a little revival, I'm going to lay down. I'm just exhausted. (laughs) Yeah, I bet you are. So I go and lay down. I have shin splints so bad that I can't go to sleep. My legs are just, and he's going, could you be still? (laughs) So then I go outside, and I thought, okay, I'm just going to call my sister. I'm going to talk on the phone. I'm going to vent this out. I'm going to get this out of my system. And I call her, and I'm out walking across back and forth front yard. And the pastor's wife finally came out of the basement from where she was working, and she was probably down there laughing the whole time, <laughs> buttermilk falls, <laughs> like there's a buttermilk falls. And she goes, be careful because our whole front yard is full of ticks. Aww. I'm like, if I have one tick on me, somebody's going to die. <laughs> somebody's going to die. Anyway, you know what? That, there was no spectacular view there. There was nothing. But you know what, we need to stay on the path. You know what, we might say, are we there yet? How much further? Is it worth it? Those are all the questions I ask. When we go somewhere, they're like, you know, at the top of this hill, you're, and I go, what are we going to see? Because it has to be something momentous. I'm not going. I'm not, I'm not going up there. I'll wait right here. You run up there, you take your phone, you take a picture of it, and you just shoot it right down to me, okay? That's going to save me and my knees a lot of things. But, you know, we, we, when we stay on the path, we're helping keep others on the path. And 
One of the ways we do that is by our service in church. Do you know the one good thing is, is if we're busy, it keeps our mind off of things that we shouldn't be thinking about if we're busy. If somebody ever comes to me and they're having a pity party or they don't know, I said, you know what, I have something I need you to do for somebody else. And they're kind of looking at me like, but I came to talk to you. <laughs> I go, I know. And we'll talk about that later, but could you do this one thing for me to help someone else out? They're like, well, sure. And you know what? When they go to do that for somebody else, it takes their eyes off themselves. And they realize, hey, I can get involved and I can keep myself on the path and I'm keeping others on the path. You know what? I cannot do everything. I, I wish I could. I can't. I had a lady call me uh, from another state and she goes, well, you know, um, I talked to so-and-so that goes to your church and if, if somebody else would do this for them or whatever, and I go, you know what? I am really sorry. I wish I could go to everybody's house, vacuum it, clean it, make them a meal, watch their kids, feed their dogs. You know, I wish I could. I just can't. But you know what? If all of us do a little bit, it keeps the, the plate spinning in the church for everybody, whether if your church, my church, wherever you are. And so I'm just going to tell you that we, we don't need to take a hike. We need to stay on the path and do exactly what God wants us to do. Okay. Thank you. All right, we have made it to the end of our ladies' conference, and I hope we all are happy campers. But if you've ever gone to camp as kids, at the end of a camp week, you have to give out the camp awards. So tonight, or today, 1 o'clock, we're going to give out a few camp awards real quick. Um, one, the first award we want to give to today is for our camp MVP. And we could not have done everything that we've done the last two days without this person's help. And he has, it's not, he, he doesn't even fit the ladies conference thing, but Brother Colby up in the sound booth, he has been taking care of everything for us. And so we have uh, the camp MVP presented to Colby Pennington. And we are so thankful. We have a few gift cards in here for you. Yes. Perfect. All right. And then there's a few other ladies we want to introduce to you that have been helping a lot this week really quickly. Mm -hmm. Hold on. Okay. Yep. Okay. Uh, let's go ahead and... Let's recognize that the celebration award for this camp is for most supportive. The most supportive camper is going to go to Carissa Dalby. Where's Carissa? Come on down. Come stand with us. You can come stand with us for just a minute. Carissa's been on the piano, um, lots of practices with the groups and on her own, so we appreciate her willingness to help. Next, we have um, the team player award. This person is willing to do whatever, whenever, however. Um, this would go to uh, Miss Cindy Howe. Come on down, Cindy. Okay, um, then we have the uh, Creative Star. The Creative Star Award goes to Miss Mindy Holman. She's the one that thought up all this stuff. Come on down. These are our assistant pastor's wives here, in case you don't know. Um, the next one is the Bright Idea Award. I love to give a project to this lady because when you give it to her, you don't even have to think about it again. She's going to figure it out. She's not going to say, how do you want me to do that? And this time I said, I don't even know how, you, how to do it. I'm going to give you this to do it, and you just take it from there. Bright Ideas goes to Miss Sarah Hoxie. Our, come on down, Sarah. Our kindness award um, goes to someone that always has a positive. You try to say negative, they're going to put a smile on your face and say a positive, and that would go to Miss Becca Vestal. Um, the helping hand award, she's going to be right there helping with whatever she sees, or if you just look up and she catches your eye, she's going to be helping. Helping hand camper award goes to Miss Summer Malucci. Um, 
someone that quietly is in their place doing their thing, um, reliable. The Meekness Camper Award goes to Miss Stephanie Johnston. Uh, my partner in crime, no, no, that's not the award. Um, Miss Sarah Gardner is Miss Compassionate. She's always willing to do whatever, whenever. Is she with Amberly or is she here? No, there she is. Come on down, Sarah. Sarah and I work in the office together, and um, she helps think of things I don't think of. And this is sweet Amberly with her. Two more. Um, kind of new to our team, but exciting, is the Need Filler Award. This person, no matter what you need, she helps you think it through. She's kind of OCD like me in the planning department, and that's always very helpful. Um, she's our co-pastor's wife, Miss Alicia Lehman, if you'll come. And the last award is going to go to our, oh, wait a minute, I forgot something. I'll tell you in a second on that one, um, is our all-star camper. You know, the one that everybody wanted to get when you were at camp, the all-star camper. Um, everything relies on this person. Everything you see and all, everything that we do wouldn't happen without our all-star camper. And that would go to Mrs. Vicki Mudge. <laughs> and um, our Grandview ladies are so appreciative of this whole team. But we are, uh, want to honor our pastor's wives, and we have in these envelopes a little um, money. Uh, Miss Vicki is wanting to do a little decorating in her, her master bathroom, and so we have cash in, in the envelope. So, Miss Vicki, that's for you. And then uh, we have cash in the envelope for Miss Alicia. She can choose to do anything she wants to do with it that, has, that is for you. It's not for your kids or your family. It's for you. So this is for Miss Alicia. And quite honestly, none of this conference could happen without these hard workers. They make it look easy. Would you help me thank them? This lady has done so much to put it all together. Let's thank Miss Kristen. Oh, yes. well. Well, thank you so much. We always appreciate you coming. We always have fun getting to see you and get reacquainted with you every time. And I hope you have the best travel home, however far or close you are. And thank you for coming. And you are, oh, yes. Oh, wait, wait, we've got one more little video. Well, I hope you've had a fun time listening to our speakers. Now, Ned wasn't here to get all that but it's helped me be a happy camper. And I'm so glad she got good teaching because Nellie needs that from time to time, if, if you know what I mean. And if any of you know where Ned can go to a men's meeting and learn how to be a happy camper there, I'll I'm be glad all... to teach that men's conference because no. you know men need what I've got to say. No. Anyway, let's just tell them goodbye, Ned. Anyway, thank you for joining our camping theme. And we are so glad that you came, right? Right, and we hope to see you again next year. Bye-bye.